Ah, we're back in Australia, the land down under. Australia is full of all kinds of things that'll probably just mess you up. Whether it's giant saltwater crocodiles, or it's just some crazy kangaroos who are trying to have a boxing match with you and your dog, you never know what Australia's gonna throw at you. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today we're going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true Australian horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. Joining me today is my good friend Lady Spookaria from Australia. They will be sharing story number two, and if you enjoy their voice, definitely check out the link in the description to find their channel. They post a lot of good videos, and I think you'd enjoy the stories they share. A series of creepy events by some Aussie mates. My name is Adeline. I have three pretty scary experiences to share. I'll caveat this story by saying I think Australia is rather safe, and I think I've just been <laughs> extremely unlucky. The first experience happened 11 years ago. I was around 16 years old. I was a pretty wild child and had quite a grown up figure for my age as my friends and I liked to dress up. My friend and I wanted to sneak into some clubs. The legal age is 18 here in Australia, as they didn't used to check ages at the door that much. We would then get guys to buy us drinks or whatever, as they typically checked your age at the bar. We did this almost every single weekend for quite some time, and nothing really ever happened. Then, one night in the middle of winter, we had this guy buy us some vodkas, and I have no memory from that point forward. I barely remember his appearance. He seemed like an average guy in his early 20s. I woke up freezing and coughing. I don't have a great memory of this, but I remember my eyes stinging from dust or sand. My mouth was so dry and full of dirt, and I was so cold. The cold where it seems to pierce your bones. I had the worst headache I had ever had. I could barely move or open my eyes because of the pain. Eventually, I was able to sit up, it was just before dawn and there was some light but not too much. I started to freak out when I realized I was not entirely buried. There was about an inch of dirt on top of me. I still had my dress on but no shoes. I couldn't think straight, but I knew something terrible must have happened. I must have been kidnapped. From what I could tell, I was somewhere in a rural area and it was like a grazing paddock. I saw a road about 400 meters away and a few cars driving down it. It took me ages to walk to the road. I was incredibly dizzy and kept losing my balance and landing on my knees, which were now pretty much cut up and bleeding. When I finally reached the road, I flagged down a car. I was so thankful they stopped. It was a young woman, and she seemed pretty freaked out by this bloody dirty girl who had just stumbled onto the highway. She helped me into her passenger seat and draped her coat over me. At this point, I couldn't stop shivering, either from the cold or maybe I was just going into shock. She kept asking me questions like my name or what had happened, but I, I couldn't answer. After just a few minutes, I must have passed out again. I woke up some time later and the sun was now up. I could hear her talking on the phone with someone. She was saying how she had me. I was still unconscious, and she was close to the drop-off point, and she would wait for them. I freaked out. In my state, I thought she must have been taking me back to the kidnappers. I started screaming, which resulted in her crashing her car into a ditch. She stopped, opened the car door, and ran onto the road. She was trying to calm me down, but I was hysterical. Then, from a distance, I saw red and blue lights. It was the police and an ambulance. That's who she was talking to. About 20 minutes in the ambulance later, I became a little more coherent. They told me I had been reported missing last night, and about 9 hours ago, this is when they started looking for me. When my friend couldn't find me in the club, she phoned my parents, and when the club had closed, they found my wallet and coat. They immediately acted on the missing persons report, as I was still a minor. The working theory is that I was drugged at the club and taken away. The doctors found no evidence that I had been interfered with. They thought maybe I had overdosed on a drug, or maybe the guy thought he had killed me or something. He must have freaked out and tried to quote unquote hide the body. They think I laid in the shallow grave for most of the night. I'll never know exactly what happened, but the police opened an extensive investigation. I reviewed the security footage and sent round photos of the guy buying me a drink, but there was never any arrest. 
The scariest thing about this is that it started as just a regular night. Strange Experiences as a Travel Influencer by some Aussie mate. My friend Jess is an Australian travel influencer. She and her boyfriend travel around Australia in a van and share great beach locations, restaurants, clothes, etc. They earn pretty good money for it, enough to keep them on a perpetual holiday. This one time, they were on a deserted beach in the Northern Territory, and technically they were trespassing, as this was native land, and you weren't allowed to just use it. They said it was stunning, and they were taking loads of photos, bikini photos, etc., and they were pleased with their content. After about two hours, a bunch of Aboriginal kids turned up, four boys. When I say kids, they were between 10 and 14. They called my friend a few names and told them they weren't allowed here. Jess and her boyfriend got the message and started packing up their things. Unfortunately, Jess and I laid out a photo shoot worthy picnic, so packing took a little while. They noticed the kids found a goanna, a relatively sizable Australian lizard, and were proceeding to kill it by whacking it against a rock. Jess didn't want to be judged, as she knew aboriginals were allowed to hunt and kill native animals, but the violence unsettled both her and her boyfriend. Jess thinks the kids were trying to show off to her. After all, she was a glamorous girl in a tiny bikini. Jess then said she had the strangest experience of her life. She said all the sounds were just turned off and the wind died. The kids noticed it too. Jess then said she heard murmurs from the trees just past the beach, like people were talking to each other, and it sounded angry. Jess and her boyfriend scanned the tree line to see who was coming. They didn't want to get into trouble for being on native land. At first, they didn't see anything, except something was moving, as she glimpses of it, like a human. But Jess thought it was too tall for a human, and too pale. Most of the people out here were Aboriginal, and these figures were pale. Like, strangely white, Jess couldn't be sure of what they were. Every time she went to focus on one, it was gone. It was like they were always just out of direct sight. She couldn't say what they looked like because she never got a good look, but she could tell there were at least ten, maybe more. The kids started to panic and called out that the mimics were there to punish them for disrespecting the goanna. The murmurs were still impossible to make out, but were louder and more angry than before. Jess said she'd only had this feeling once before, and that's when she scuba dived with a tiger shark. The feeling like she was prey. Everything in her body screamed she was in danger, and needed to leave. Jess and her boyfriend jumped into the car and were about to leave, but the kids ran up to them, screaming. Despite her boyfriend's objections, Jess let them into the car, and they all piled into the back seat and pleaded for them to drive, but to leave. They had to go along the road through the trees, right where the figures were. Her boyfriend drove down the dirt road quickly without breaking the car. Jess scanned the trees as they went through them. She saw nothing. Just the typical bushland you would expect. When they eventually joined the main road, they let the boys out. She offered to drive them to their homes, but they said they would walk. Later, Jess looked up what a Mimi was supposed to be. They are ancient spirits in Australia who first taught aboriginals how to hunt and use fire. There are loads of old cave paintings of them. They are supposed to be tall and thin and stay hidden in the bushland. They are supposed to be calm, but are known to get upset when intruders are on their land. Or, someone kills or injures one of their pets. Jess and her boyfriend don't believe in anything supernatural and are atheists. But this experience made them wonder if there are things out there that we don't fully understand. Jess's next story converted her from a non-believer to someone open to the supernatural. She and her boyfriend were checking into a hotel in a small country town during their travels. Their van toilet was broken, and they just needed a rest from van life. Or at least that's what her boyfriend told her. This place was just more excellent than what they usually could afford. It was a beautiful old homestead. While waiting in line to check in, she started talking to another waiting guest. The guy casually asked if they were ghost hunters too. She quickly asked why, and the other guest explained that this was one of the most haunted places in the state. He told her there were supposed to be multiple ghosts, including an old man, a young woman, and shadow figures of kids in the mirrors and glass. 
Jess's face must have shown some concern, but the concierge intervened and told her, there is nothing here that can hurt you, and if you do see something, just ignore it. And he said it with a smile and wink, so she couldn't tell if he was joking or not. Later that night, her boyfriend proposed while enjoying a fantastic meal in the hotel restaurant. It was an incredible moment and took her by surprise. She cried in joy and said yes, in true influencer fashion. She wanted photos to document the occasion. So, she went to the bathroom to fix her makeup. While touching up her face, she saw a blur behind in her mirror. She turned her head, thinking someone else must be in the bathroom, but it was only her. She looked back in the mirror and saw a shadow lurking in the cubicle. She looked behind her, and there was nothing. She leaned forward and studied the mirror. She could see it. There was a precise shadow figure hovering in the cubicle. She wasn't scared. As she remembered the words that they couldn't hurt her, it became clear to her that it only existed in the mirror's reflection and not on her side. It seemed to sense her lack of fear. Its movements became jerky, as though it was angry, and it rushed out of the cubicle. Jess didn't move, though and she continued to do her makeup. The shadow seemed to be angrier and angry at her lack of reaction. It now stood directly behind her in the reflection in the mirror and tried to claw at her. She felt nothing though, and she wouldn't let some shadow ruin her night. When she was done, she turned around without hesitation and there was nothing behind her. And she returned to the restaurant. She said she wasn't going to let a shadow ruin her night. My friend Luke has a couple of strange events. Now, Luke is a doctor and doesn't believe in anything supernatural, but he has these events that even he has to confess. There are no explanations. The first happened when he was 19 and still living at home. It was almost midnight. His parents were asleep and his younger brother was out. He walked past his brother's room and was surprised to see the neon blue glow of his gaming computer. His brother was a huge gamer. He never leaves it on when he's out. Luke entered the room to see if his brother was home but the space was empty and untouched. He suddenly wanted to call his brother, something he never usually did, but tonight, he did. His brother had been in a fight, was scared, and needed a lift home. He didn't want to call his family because he feared getting in trouble. Luke said he would be there soon and pick him up. When he looked up, the computer was off. Luke found this so strange he even touched the computer. It was cold like it had never been on. Another time when he was working at the hospital, he was doing his rounds. A middle-aged man there had just moved out of home care due to a nasty infection that needed to be treated in the hospital. He had cancer and hadn't responded well to treatment. And while he was terminal, they expected he had another six months or so to live. He went to check on him before leaving for the evening and was surprised to see he had a visitor, a middle-aged woman holding his hand. Luke was surprised for a few reasons. One, it was way past visiting hours. And also, Luke had been told he had no living family. And due to COVID, only immediate family were allowed visitation rights. The man introduced the woman as his sister. And the woman just smiled. Luke said goodnight. And the man said, I'm glad I saw you tonight. I wanted to say goodbye. Luke laughed and said he will be back tomorrow to check on him. That man died unexpectedly that night and none of the nurses or doctors remembered him having a visitor. My Creature Encounter by Zoomstar43 I live in a rural town in Australia, and I'm used to seeing kangaroos and hares when I walk alone. This was on a Saturday, and I went for a walk on this trail that I had found. It was roughly 30 or 40 minutes away from my house. The trail follows a bike track till you reach a fork in the path. If you leave, you end up back at the beginning of the way. If you head right, you follow this very narrow trail. You can barely fit two people walking side by side on it. So I continue down this track. And usually, I hear birds chirping and just general wildlife noises. Still, I couldn't hear a single noise but the wind blowing in the trees around me and the crunching of gravel under my shoes. So I continued my walk for about 10 or 20 minutes. When I started to pick up on the leaves crunching behind me as if someone was trying to follow me without being heard. They were trailing me, 
and I thought nothing of it at first, so I kept walking for just some time before I heard a massive tree crack. It was as if somebody or something had stepped on a large tree branch and broke it in half. This caused me to stop and jump back as I started scanning the tree line for whatever made that loud noise. I noticed I saw a large black figure duck behind a few trees. They were only about 100 to 200 meters away from me. Now I knew this wasn't a kangaroo by the size of the figure. It's hard to describe, but I will do my best. It was like a six foot human, but its arms were abnormally long. They stretched down from its shoulder to the ground, and its head was tilted nearly 90 degrees sideways, almost as if it wasn't connected to its body. As I saw this figure duck behind the thick trees and shrubs, I stood there staring at where I last saw the figure. What scared me, and is engraved in my mind, was its eyes peeking through the bushes, those dark red eyes that felt like they were staring into my soul. I felt helpless. I felt like prey. I felt like this was an apex predator. When I saw this, my whole body became fearful. All my joints started shaking, and this eerie fear washed over me as my body ran before my brain could even comprehend what I had just seen. As I was sprinting away, I could hear leaves and branches cracking loudly as if I was getting chased by something significant and fast. I never looked back as I was chased for what seemed like ages my blood coursing through my veins and my adrenaline at an all-time high. That's when I heard the most high-pitched screeching sound that I've ever heard in my life. I didn't even know vocal cords could even remotely make these sounds. I immediately dove behind a big mound of dirt out of complete fear. I sat there trying to restrain my breathing as to not give away my position. I heard the sound of leaves cracking and coming from the other side of the dirt mound. I sat there holding my breath when I heard this thing bolt past me at such an incredible speed that I was shocked that it didn't catch me earlier. It started getting dark as I sat there for what seemed like hours. I was waiting for this thing to return at any moment. Finally, I knew I had to move or otherwise I would be here in the pitch black and I would have to use my phone flashlight to navigate. And with that thing looking around, I knew I would be a dead man. So I nervously got up and sprinted back to town. The rest of the day was seemingly normal, and I have never heard or seen anything like that ever again. But I still refuse to go down that trail, as I've never been that fearful for my life, and I'm grateful that I hid in that fork in the road, because I would not be typing this here today. Urban Exploration Gone Wrong by Accomplished Mix For a bit of background, I live in South Australia and I am 17 years old. I have always been interested in exploring abandoned buildings, so for my birthday, I decided to meet up with a friend that I met on TikTok that goes urban exploring. I'll call him Jack. To set the scene, it was a slightly warm day in Adelaide. My friend Chris and I caught a bus to town and met Jack at a bookstore. After hanging out for some time roller skating in an empty car park, we explored an abandoned gallery seven or nine stories tall. I forgot the exact number. Jack crawled through a tiny vent to unlock the doors, and Chris and I waited for him. After gaining entrance, we explored the building 30 minutes from top to bottom. Everything was going well when we encountered this large red stain on one of the floors. It was still wet with a few cigarette butts left roughly in the center of the paint. All three of us agreed that the color was very suspicious and looked like blood, but we couldn't tell if it was blood or paint. At one point, Chris and I were at the center of the floor, looking down at this mezzanine or indoor balcony. Jack was trying to pry a door open to my left about eight meters away. Suddenly, he let out a scream and dropped his torch. I looked up trying to figure out what had scared him, I thought that maybe he had seen a giant spider or something dumb. After staring at the door for quite a few seconds, I saw a hand squeezing through the hole where the doorknob would have been. My friends and I quickly regrouped and walked away from the door, right where the stain that looked like blood was. A few seconds later, the hand's owner started walking rapidly toward us. As three teenagers, we all felt just a little bit nervous. The hand's owner was an older male in his 30s, maybe more significant than us in size. 
Nevertheless, Jack remained calm and started having a conversation with the man. The older male told us that he was from Melbourne, had been drinking with some friends in a band, and stayed there overnight. He then noticed the stain on the ground, and that is where things get a bit weird. He told us that his friends had removed the body and demanded that we were not to tell anyone. We all collectively agreed not to tell anyone, and we were feeling properly weirded out by this point. So I pulled out my pocket knife, keeping it behind me just in case. The man did eventually leave us alone, and so we got out of there. After a couple of months, probably somewhere around February 2023 to be exact, Jack and I met up again and ended up exploring that same building. The stain was still there, but this time it looked like somebody had poured another liquid on top of it to try to clean it. They did a half-assed job. Nothing weird happened during that exploration except for an alarm that Jack did not set off, or myself set off, going off by itself. There was a mutual feeling that somebody else had been in that building, but it's hard to say for sure. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true Australian horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to slap that like button so it feels it. Be sure to subscribe if you're new and turn on notifications to never miss a new episode as I upload them nearly every single day on all things natural and supernatural. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube Premium but still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and just about anywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. If you're listening on one of those platforms, be sure to give us a five-star rating over there as it helps us grow, and that's very, very appreciated. I'd love to know in the comments down below what story tonight was your favorite. It helps me pick better stories for the future. Let me know what country you would like to see me cover. I definitely plan on covering a couple more countries here very soon, so if you guys have any more suggestions, definitely let me know, and hopefully we'll get enough stories to do so. Be sure to comment the code word ZOOMY down below to let me know you made it to the end and to confuse anybody who didn't. The funniest comment will be pinned at the top. Many thanks to my friend Lady Spukaria who read story number two tonight. Be sure to check out their channel and subscribe if you're a fan. You can find a link in the description. And I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.